Today, we learn how to play unsafe with Graham Walmsley. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the DiceGeeks.com tabletop RPG show. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and better role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. If you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Davids. I am the author of the Books of Random Tables series. You can find those on Amazon.com, on DriveThruRPG.com, and on my website, DiceGeeks.com. They are all geared to help game masters cut down their GM prep time. Now, I have a really great guest today, so I'm not going to waste any more time. Here's the interview. My guest today is writer and game designer, Graham Walmsley. Graham, welcome to the show. Hi. Hello. It's good to be here. Just to start off the show, I really like to ask people how they were introduced to tabletop role-playing games. I don't know. This was a long time ago. So, I mean, you know, if you're asking when... Wow. Um, I mean, I, I think in the UK, that like the first thing I, I played, which was close to a tabletop role-playing game, was um, the Fighting Fantasy books, which I, I think, like in the US, you had Choose Your Own Adventure, but, mm-hmm. but we had, like, fighting fantasy so so they kind of started me uh started me going and then i bought a copy of like tunnels and trolls in our local news agent and we started playing i had a group of people and, and we used to play a lot of dungeons and dragons um a lot of this game called golden heroes which was this british superhero game uh, the, the designer simon burley is still still doing stuff today so we just yeah we played all, all that and tune we absolutely love tune um so we played that so yeah that that's it it was it was a long time ago i was young what was the appeal to you the storytelling kind of aspect to be fair i was about 10 or 11 so you know um I'd, like i wouldn't try and draw a line through my, <laughs> through my entire yeah. um you know and then and then i wrote play on safe um <laughs> oh you know it it was just fun really i mean i, I think like Dungeons and Dragons seemed quite serious to us, I think. So we like Dungeons and Dragons, like the game we felt we ought to play. So how did you then make the jump from playing tabletop role playing games to writing books about them and designing them? <laughs> um, so right, it was about a twenty or thirty year jump. Firstly, so <laughs> it's, okay. um, so no, so you know, I um, I stopped playing role playing games when I went to university and then I stopped playing them for about 10 years and it wasn't until um, I'm, uh, I started playing Vampire the Masquerade uh, so I played uh, Vampire LARPing so okay. in in the in about 2000s so I started I started LARPing and then I kind of gradually trickled back um, back into gaming from there and what actually specifically happened was I um, I bought one of a new edition of one of my favorite role playing games paranoia so there's a um, a version of paranoia called paranoia xp which was by alan varney and it was this beautifully beautifully designed game um, and right at the back of that book it said uh, they pointed you towards uh, a website where you designed role playing games um, it was called the forge and um and you know so i went wow that's really fantastic so i i went to the website and and looked at it and um and it was this sort of you know kind of fun website where people seem to be designing their own games and i thought that's really fun so i I started posting on that and and that's what got me involved so there was this real ethos on the site about designing your own stuff and um uh you know and publishing it yourself which was kind of fun and and that's what got me into it okay and then it kind of snowballed from there right (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. So I, I mean, my my first book, Play Unsafe, was um, I think at the time I didn't like have this game I wanted to publish, but I'd done a lot of improvisation, and so I wanted to like 
take up a few of things I've learned from improvisation and try and apply them to role playing games, and just sort of you know get some of the storytelling lessons out. So I, yeah, so I, I wrote that and published it, and I, I literally expected it to sell twenty or thirty copies. I was like, you know, if I sell twenty copies of this to like people I vaguely know, I will be happy, and and it sold like a hundred in the first couple of days and and it still keeps selling like gradually it keeps selling oh, well that's amazing um and yes i definitely wanted to ask you about play unsafe um so you mentioned a little bit um about uh wanting to kind of share some of your uh your experiences running games um why did you call the book play unsafe oh um I think it was the idea of of like taking a bit of a risk and um, I mean one of the central ideas of the book is that you you shouldn't just plan everything and I think this was a, a big tendency I, I saw especially among players actually to like you know to plan their moves and um, sort of think very definitely about what they were going to do in the game and what they were going to get out of it. I think one of the things I wanted to I wanted to do through the book was actually go, well, you know, actually playing can be spontaneous and it can actually be much more creative if you're spontaneous about it. Um, and so and so that's where the title came from. So it became you know, rather than play safe, it was it was play unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, do you think uh like game masters kind of over preparing is one of the main problems that you see when uh, you see people running games. It was at the time. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I think game mastering isn't just about planning an adventure for people to play through. Um, and, and you see this, I mean, quite a lot when people, I mean, when writers write scenarios or when, people write games or uh, or uh, GMs design scenarios uh, for people to play. This idea of like planning exactly what people's experience will be. Mm -hmm. And and I think rather than doing that, the you have to accept that play is a it's a it's a process that you kind of make up as you go along and you it's a process of co creation. It's not something that you know, you do by yourself and you take everyone else on a journey. It's something that you kind of um, make with your players. So, yeah, I think that's what I, I wanted to get across, this idea that it's much better to abandon a lot of the planning and and sort of throw yourself open to this idea that actually you're creating something together. It can go all, in all kinds of directions. That's kind of fun. That's actually better than, you know, it may be going the direction that you thought it would do. and um, and actually, that's quite a fun and exciting way to play. I absolutely agree. Um, because I wrote a little booklet called uh, The No Prep Game Master, where I talk about some ideas. Uh, because I think I fell into kind of uh, two uh, errors when I was younger. I would over prep and then I would railroad my players down my story that I wanted to tell. <laughs> or, yeah. And then I kind of reacted against that. And I over prepped a sandbox and then my players didn't touch a ton of material that I had created. Um, and so I was doing a lot of work for nothing. And so I, I kind of got into more of the idea of just letting things happen at the table and running with uh, uh, things as they kind of came, you know, come up at the table. As I've been going to conventions and talking and, you know, people have been seeing my book and different things like that, uh, I know a number of GMs, they are intimidated by the idea of saying, oh, well, just sit down at the table and make it up because they have this, you know, well, what are we going to do? Where, where do these ideas come from? Mm -hmm. uh, can you kind of speak to that and say, you know, um, what would help somebody kind of get over some of that? So... Look, I mean, the, the thing is, I, I, I've got to admit, I mean, these days, I, I rarely just sit down with um, with nothing in my head. Do you know what I mean? And just go, hey, let's play. Because, you know, yeah. I, I don't think people people do that. Yeah. There's always some sort of uh, framework. Sure. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, whatever kind of game you're playing. I mean, so 
you know, if you're playing, I do a lot of Lovecraftian uh, writing and, you know, you kind of know how a Lovecraftian game will go and people have this common set of expectations. So, um, so you know, you, you, you probably have a structure in your head. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, what I'm not really saying is, you know, sit down at the table, don't prepare anything and just go because I don't think anyone can do that. I mean, I guess one thing I would say is that there's a lot of value in just thinking of a few ideas that, you know, maybe you'll incorporate, maybe you won't um, as, as the game goes along. And so just to, you know, grab, I, I don't know, you know, think, okay, at one point, I, maybe I'm going to have a, um, a scene on a train. And I think that'll be, that'll be fantastic. And I, you know, I've got some ideas of like uh, the station and, uh, you know maybe there's a dining car and all this kind of thing and you don't plan these things in massive detail but you just kind of think okay maybe if this comes along here's this kind of pool of ideas I can use so yeah I mean I'd, I don't think I'd ever sit down without planning anything but at the same time it's it's more going getting away from the other extreme the idea that you have to plan everything before you sit down my best planning is done when I'm in the shower or when I'm driving or when I'm reading a book or watching a movie. It's just, yeah, getting, yeah. just getting some of those ideas and then just bring those to the table, um, but not create, um, you know, a, a massive plot line or some huge epic story without uh, bringing the characters and the players into that in some way. Yeah. And I think the other important thing is, is just to remember that um, the story is something the players tell for themselves. It's not something you tell for them. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're, you're trying to create this space where, because I mean, you know, what they care about is their character, right? So if you're sitting down as a player, you, you don't just want to sit back and listen to the GM tell their story. You, you want to sort of play your character and take them on a journey and, and, you know, do all the things you're excited about with that character. And so what you're trying to do is sort of create the space for them to do that. And that makes GMing into this, this thing where you have to, you have to listen, you have to give them opportunities. And, you know, and, and so it becomes this much more kind of um, idea of listening and building on what people are giving you rather than just like providing with them with this experience. I kind of find more and more that just listening to the players at the table, that they always give me better ideas than perhaps I had to begin with. You know, I'll introduce something and they'll start thinking of conspiracy theories or, you know, all of these things that I have just never thought of. And I can just kind of mine those for ideas and start using some of what they're saying at the table uh, in the game. Is that kind of what you're talking about as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I guess the other side of things is that, I mean, you know, I, as well as play unsafe, I, I have actually written some some Cthulhu scenarios, which are very structured things um, in a way. But even when you're playing something that seems really structured, be prepared to you know to go off at a tangent and to um, you know um, just follow what the players are giving you. Um, and that that combination of things really works well together. So you have this overall structure. You kind of know where things are going. In a way, that structure itself gives you the freedom to go, okay, you know, we know we've got a story to tell, but actually let's go off and follow this thing for a while and see where it goes. I think I, you know, I hear kind of some common uh, maybe complaints or something from GMs every once in a while in forums or, or things like that where uh, they'll say something like, well, I had created this, uh, you know, this ancient ruin, this, you know, this pyramid or something way out in the desert and i've been leading my players kind of you know they giving them clues about it and now they've started journeying there but if i entered you know if the game master you know they think oh well if i introduce like a random encounter or something the players may fixate on that little random encounter and then not get to the pyramid and then they're frustrated because they've planned out this uh you know this great kind of huge dungeon that the players would love, but the players get fascinated with, say, they, you know, they find a burned out wagon and they're trying to figure out who it belonged to and little things like that. And so I, I think I hear some, you know, game masters are frustrated kind of along those lines. What would you say to, to that person? Well, like, there's two ways to go with that, right? So you can go fully down the improvisational route and you kind of go, no, you know, if the players are fascinated with this random encounter, then go with that random encounter and see where that leads. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can also communicate with your players. I mean, this is important too. I, I think 
a lot of GMs sort of feel that the responsibility is is on them. You can just tell them you've prepared a big pyramid for them to go uh, go and explore, and they will. And and you know th- this can be it, it can be part of the deal. And so so you can say look you know this is where your adventure is taking you, um, and sure they'll. You know, most players will go along with that. They'll explore the thing they wanted to explore, and then they'll go, "Oh, now let's go to the pyramid," and that kind of makes it fine. I, I think that's great advice. That I, I think sometimes we get a little too—I don't know—maybe uptight or, or a little too—I um, don't know—a little too serious about some things. Because um, exactly what you're saying is, uh, a year or so ago, I was running a campaign. I was making up a campaign um, called the King's Road, and there was this road this white stone road that just like went on almost like unending. And I just told my players before we started to play, I was just like, you can do anything you want, but you have to keep following that road. Oh, that's nice. You know, I, I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so they're like, that sounds fine to us. We'll just keep following the road. But they wanted to do, you know, they stop occasionally and do all kinds of interesting things, but it's just like, well, at the end of the session or the next session, just start traveling down the road again. Yeah, and, and that doesn't, like, if you do that right, it doesn't take away people's freedom to create things on the way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Maybe just share one thing from Play Unsafe that would just really help a game master who may be, uh, you know, struggling or just learning uh, how to run games. What is, like, maybe one specific example or something like that you can give us from the book? Listen to what your players are giving you and then build on it. Um, it, it seems like such, if, if you do it, it seems like such an advanced skill. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're running a horror scenario and one of your players goes and sits in the corner where it's dark and starts trembling because they're, they're scared, then have something happen in that corner. You know, if a player acts as the, um, if a player says their characters are afraid of dogs, then at that point, you know there has to be a dog <laughs> coming in, and and actually, you know, maybe there's more than a dog coming in. Maybe you, uh, you know, maybe you can have kind of sounds of sounds of weird barking being like this thing that recurs throughout the adventure. So really, just sort of listening to what the players are, are giving you and just replaying it back to them, and it's not hard. It, it isn't. It, I mean, it comes across as this sort of amazing, oh my God, you listened to the thing I was giving you and you did it, but just do it. it it's absolutely fine. I think that really completes the experience for somebody when they add something to their backstory that the game master can then use. They feel like, oh, well, this was part of the adventure or this was part of the thing all along. Yeah, yeah, and it just yeah. seems like it, it kind of creates this seamless thing. You know, maybe this might just leave the the book just a little bit, but uh, you know, um, just thinking about running games. I know I also run into a lot of people who maybe they've been playing for a while and they say, "Oh, you know, I have this really cool idea and I want to try running games," but they're just they're afraid. They're afraid to run the games now. And um, for me, you know, when I started, you know, I I started when I was a child, so there was, you know, I was free to make mistakes without hardly any, you know, any uh, uh, any uh, uh, consequences or anything like that. But I think sometimes people are feel like, oh, well, I have to be to a certain standard before I can get, you know, run a game. What would you say to somebody who's thinking that? I think it's it's a real shame that we we build up this idea of you know the gm who creates everyone everything and has to create this amazing thing for everyone else to experience mm-hmm. and and actually they're you know they are just one of the group so you know i mean what i'd say is that you know play with play with people you know mm-hmm. and then the first time you run the game and the people you know will make the game work right you know that they, they will you know they, they'll treat you well and they'll, they'll they will help you gm in a way um, I mean, it's it's worth saying that not all games have GMs, so you can play one of the games that doesn't have a GM. Um, you know, the, I mean, one of the most famous ones is probably Fiasco by Jameson Morningstar, which is a fantastic game and it works without having a GM. But like, there's less lesser wit- known ones. There's a, a game called Witch: The Road to Lindisfarne and things like that. So there are a lot of games without GMs, um, and. I, I guess, you know, just generally, I, I would much rather that gaming wasn't about the GM doing their thing and everyone else just watching them and going, wow, this is a great adventure. 
uh, you know, it, it should be this this process of co-creation. I, I always think it's a shame too when I hear somebody who's who's like, oh well, I'm I'm not good enough to run a game, or um, I, I don't know enough to be the GM or something like that. It's just um, uh, just to me, it just robs. It just means that you know some people are just missing out on being able to play in the hobby because you know somebody is just feeling that they're maybe they're not Matt Mercer or something like that. Honestly, I'm more worried about the the GMs who think they know exactly how to do it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Because um, that that brings up a whole another side of the thing. Because I would absolutely like a GM who is learning and making mistakes than one yeah. who who just uh, maybe you know anoints himself king and just <laughs> just making pronouncements to his lowly players. Absolutely. Yeah, I know there's some listeners out there who who haven't run a game yet, and they they're thinking about it. It's just like I would, yeah, I, I would rather sit through somebody who is honestly trying to learn how to run a game. You know, I would sit through that any day of the week. <laughs> and then, um, uh, like that does not bother me if somebody is just honestly trying to learn how to 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 run a game or or trying it for the first time. That doesn't bother me one bit um and it is absolutely the person who uh uh has no flexibility and thinks they know everything that's usually uh causes the problem yeah yeah definitely yeah unless it's me in which case it's the right thing (laughs) well there you go yeah yeah unless it's one of my games then (laughs) you can just do what i say and (laughs) and everything will be good no 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 no, and uh, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, I mean, that brings up something else too. It's just like that, you know, uh, sure, I, I've wrote, you know, a little book about this. I've been GMing for 30 or more years or so, but it's just like, I learn something new each time. I, I figure, you know, I make a ton of mistakes each time. I I realize, you know, just the other night, I realized that, you know, I just totally didn't describe something very well to the players. And it's just like, what, I'm tired. I'm thinking about something else, you know, who knows? And it's just like, we all make mistakes all the time. And as long as we're being honest and uh, with each other and we're, we're having, you know, trying to work on everybody's enjoyment, I, I don't see any problem with making a, a whole bunch of mistakes or, or having to, you know, even retcon some things that you messed up or messing up rules or anything like that. I think it goes back to the thing of, of talking to your players, right? I mean, I, you know, you should always be talking to your players and you can admit when you've made a mistake. Um, you know, it shouldn't be just you, like you there GMing like you're on a stage. Um, I think this happens quite a lot. I, I read uh, sort of threads on, on Reddit or you know various other places or Facebook groups, and people say, I've got this problem with my players, and, um, you know, one of them's doing this, and, and I don't want them to. And I, I just want to answer all the threads. Talk to them. <laughs> you know, talk, talk, talk the problem through. Explain why you don't want them to do that or why it's disrupting the game and talk to them but you can't post that on on every thread because people just get annoyed with you (laughs) but but it's important i think there's so much that can be solved with well you know what game did you think you were playing you know like what adventure or what campaign did you kind of what kind of campaign did you think you were playing at the beginning and if you've talked about that i, I feel that eliminates almost 90 percent of the problem because that just eliminates somebody making you know a, a, i don't know like a you know a, just a character that just does not fit the scenario it's just like well did you even tell them what kind of scenario you're running or or anything like that yeah yeah i don't know i I get frustrated sometimes with a lot of those those threads as well just seeing uh, i mean they're basically the same thing over and over again and it's just like um yeah just uh talk to them explain that you know you you can't have that kind of character in this kind of world and why are we you know why did we have that disconnect is probably because you didn't explain the scenario at the at the beginning yeah, or, or or listen to them, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be, you know, explain the scenario to them. I mean, it can be, um, but it can also be okay. You're you're playing this character. What what do you want out of this? What yeah. you know? How can we twist what we're doing so it actually gives you what you want? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, you know, it can be about you adapting to them as well as uh, you know explaining things to the players. Yeah, yeah. 
No, no, I agree. And, and I think just a, just a little bit of a counterpoint then, uh, you know, I think then sometimes some GMs think then that they're there just to kind of serve the player's whims a little bit um, instead of realizing there's a bit of give and take there um, that, um, you know, if you're not comfortable playing a certain game or you wanted to, you know, limit certain options because of the story or something like that, that, uh, that those are acceptable to your players before you start the game. Yeah. I think sometimes I know when I was younger, it, you know, uh, certainly and you know, a player would come up with a certain idea and I just hadn't thought of it before. So maybe sometimes I would reflexively shut it down because I just didn't think of it before or didn't imagine it before instead of taking just a second and saying, Oh, actually, that could be really fun to jump some, you, you'll use that and jump off of that and create an adventure or a situation that I never thought of before. Sure. You've also uh, created Cthulhu Dark. Uh, could you tell us a little about that? Yeah, definitely. Well, how, how Cthulhu Dark came about. So I have about three different stories I tell about how, um, how Cthulhu Dark actually, actually happened. Um, I think the one that's, closest to being true actually the one that's closest to being true is that i i wrote it in about uh what, probably 10 years ago so 2010 something like that mm. and and at the time there were loads of amazing mini games about um, that, and they were being released for free so um i mean one of the one of the most famous one the famous ones is probably lady blackbird by john harper uh, which is this amazing game, and it's it's only about six pages long, but it's incredibly evocative and very beautiful, and and the uh, the mechanics are very minimal. Um, and at the same time, I was writing scenarios for Gumshoe, and um, which also ha- is quite simple at its heart, but actually has like pages and pages of rules. And I was I was selling games on my. Uh, I had a booth at a convention. I was selling games one day, and I was like, "Actually, what I was doing was I was selling some of my um, my gumshoe scenarios, and they were like, I'd, I'd made these like beautiful little books that mm-hmm. you know that each of them had a scenario in. And sometimes people would come up and kind of go, "Oh, so does this run by itself?" And I kind of go, "No, you need a system to play it with." And you know, and then they, you know, they'd either go off and buy a trailer Cthulhu or they wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And but I, I just kind of thought, how hard would it be to just write a system, a Cthulhu system, on on a couple of pages? You know, something like Lady Blackbird, but just a kind of you know, how short could you get a Cthulhu system? And and I, I think I made most of the system up that day, right? So you know, you you can imagine like a very simple investigative system is you're trying to find something out and you roll one dice. But if you've got a skill which helps you out, um, you roll another dice along with that, and then you take the highest value. Yeah, so, you know, in, in basic terms, that Cthulhu Dark came together really quickly. And, and then the, I mean, the other thing is um, the, there's an insight die, which is which is you know, what was probably used to be called insanity or sanity in, in sort of other Cthulhu systems. Yeah, so that, that, that's just the, the other mechanic which sort of ticks up and up and up. Okay. In, Okay, so your your whole premise was to make just like an extremely like lightweight system for it. Yeah, lightweight, but still you know, rules that were lightweight, but still actually push the narrative forward, mm-hmm. right? Because that's the challenge. I mean, you know, actually writing a lightweight game is not hard. You can write very very short systems indeed, but I think the real challenge is sort of writing something that's short, but the rules actually do do something. What is this setting? Is it just kind of standard Cthulhu, or did you do something to try to set the setting apart? Um, Cthulhu Dark itself doesn't have a setting, okay. so it, uh, yeah, it, I, I, I wanted to sort of abstract it from the sort of traditional twenties, thirties New England thing. So the book itself uh, is, I mean, it's, it's setting agnostic, and then it gives, you, it gives you four different settings you can play in. So it gives you early Victorian London. It gives you, um, oh, I've got to remember them now. It gives you Arkham, which is Lovecraft's um, iconic city, but it gives you that sort of inner time of witchcraft. Um, and then there's uh, 
there's a setting uh, which was written for me by Helen Gould, who's a very brilliant author, which is essentially modern day Africa. And then there's uh, there's a cyberpunk Mumbai setting. So where can people uh, pick up Cthulhu Dark? So Cthulhu Dark, you can get it from Indie Press Revolution. Mm-hmm. That's probably the best place. So Indie Press Revolution uh, has hardback and PDF copies of Cthulhu Dark, and you should go and buy it. And if you just <laughs> Google Cthulhu Dark, you will uh, you'll you'll find the original two page version of Cthulhu Dark, and and that will you know show you what it's about. And then the the book itself just expands on all of that. Okay, and then now you have you have also written a book like uh, about running Cthulhu games, isn't that right? Oh, is this? Do you mean stealing Cthulhu? Yeah, right. So that's actually not running Cthulhu games. That that's again oh. how that's how to write Cthulhu um, oh. adventures. Oh, okay. Okay, well then, I'm 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 terribly sorry. I misunderstood. No, it's fine because I I write games. I write books about running games and about writing and all kinds of things. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So, um, well, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. What uh, what does somebody need to know if they're going to write a Cthulhu adventure? So here's the thing, right? And I've actually kind of written two different books, which gives you two different ways to think about this. Okay. Um, so. In Stealing Cthulhu, what I basically say is start with one of Love, Lovecraft plots and adapt it. Um, and in Cthulhu Dark, what I say is start with something you want to tell a story about. So like something that you want to, um, that you're scared of or you know, a piece of history or you're, you kind of want to twist in some way and, and go from there. So I think there's, there's different ways to do it. I mean, I, I always think with horror, it's best to think of something that that scares you or that creeps you out because i think so much horror is not scary um so i and i think horror gets interesting when it actually does go into this very human place and become about you know things which which scare us so yeah i i would start with there i mean start with start with something you're you're interested to explore preferably something that scares you and then think of a way of sort of wrapping a wrapping a narrative around that. So in a sort of, I mean, if you're following the, the Cthulhu Dark way of doing things, you'll you'll start with something that scares you. You'll you'll think of one of Lovecraft's, um, or think of a basically a creature which sort of embodies that fear in some way. Um, so you know, if you're talking about a fear of the sea, then at that point you can go and do something with the Deep Ones or the or Cthulhu. Um, and, and then you, you sort of plan that into an ad- adventure which almost like turns the heat up on the players very, very slowly. So um, so you remember that thing I said before, which is that, you know, a scenario is based, is not just like you telling a story. It's about giving the players the chance to play their characters and sort of tell their story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Cthulhu scenarios are a bit like that, really. So you're, you know, you're you're providing this sort of scary environment, and you're gradually revealing this this growing horror to them. Um, and and you know, the further and further you go, the the more that you reveal the, that the horror was even worse than you thought it was before. Until eventually, you know, you discover it's absolutely mind blowing. But kind of the point of the scenario is is not that. Um, what you're actually doing is, uh, I mean, the story is much more the characters, the, the investigators, and how they how they interact, what happens to them when you present them with this mind blowing horror. So that's what you're trying to do to them. You're trying you're trying to sort of uh, reveal this this unbelievably scary stuff, but then you're you're letting the investigators react to that. That sounds really good, and I, I I really like the um I really like the idea of trying to start with something that that you are scared of. Um, I think that that would really um uh, that really uh, uh starts with this something that could uh, be kind of visceral and something that probably taps into something else that a lot of people are afraid of as well. I did this um, years ago. I, I had um, I had a bit of a skin infection, and I uh, I 
I found I was becoming vaguely obsessed with like little spots on my skin. <laughs> um, I mean, a, a little like, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking um, when there's a massive scare around coronavirus. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, I, I imagine you and uh, various people listening to this will be sort of vaguely obsessed with kind of symptoms of illness at the moment. Yeah. Do you, do you have this thing where you're kind of going, I, I feel a bit hot? Yeah. Or, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm, yeah. And I think it's, and I'm not trying to make light of this at all, but, but I think it's yeah. really interesting to look at those moments, which like actually when you, these things which make you not think rationally. Yeah. Um, and think what that will be like. And then, and then almost create scenarios which, explore that even more so i mean what happened to me years ago was that uh, i was sort of, uh, talking about skin infections and you know becoming vaguely obsessed with i you know i'd, I'd have to sort of look at my skin and going that that spot was that was that there before mm-hmm. um and i eventually wrote this up as a cthulhu scenario it became the uh the first scenario in cthulhu apocalypse which is my post-apocalyptic campaign and there was this uh, the first scenario in that is uh, is when you have uh, little plants which grow in your skin, mm. um, and, and so you uh, the world is covered with these these flowers, and um, and you you sort of make people become vaguely obsessed with the fact that it's like something's like slight growing under their skin, or there's little plant in their arm which is just slowly growing, mm. which I think is very creepy. But it all grew out of this thing of like me being being vaguely obsessed. You are right, because I, I see people now, right? We, if, if our th- throat is a little dry and we have a bit of a cough, we, we start wondering if it's something big, right? And not just something has changed to where now we're thinking of, of something major instead of, oh, I'm, you know, I'm reacting to pollen or something like that because it's springtime. Now, um, you mentioned uh, a Cthulhu apocalypse. Could you tell us a little about that? Oh, so that was a campaign I wrote for Pelgrim Press a while ago, and I, I, I think it came from a place we we were had this weekly gaming group at the time, and of course the threat in Cthulhu games is always that the world will end, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the world will end and everything will be horrible, and and I basically kind of wanted to run this scenario where actually at the end of it the world really did genuinely end, <laughs> and you know, and and so I I wrote a scenario where uh, where that actually happened. And, in, and and then that was the first scenario of a campaign where the world had ended. And I was fascinated as well to sort of explore the various post-apocalyptic uh, books. So I wrote, I, I read loads of um, post-apocalyptic books as part of that thing. So actually what starts happening there is that uh, the camp, it was originally going to be this 12 scenario campaign. Um, and it, uh, it starts with it starts with um, a very John Wyndham apocalypse. John Wyndham is a, a 1950s British writer who I don't think is very um, very well known outside Britain, but he, he writes these sort of slow burn apocalypses where you kind of wander about this destroyed world and uh, um, I don't know reflect on it. I I, I really like his writing. Mm. Um, and then what would a re- uh, what I originally was going to have happen was that uh, eventually the investigators sort of went across the United States and then they, they sort of went through this much more um, almost like US style apocalypse, which is, is much more sort of uh, travel across this blasted nuclear wasteland. Yes, uh, us Americans, we usually do seem to uh, want to travel across uh, the wasted landscape. <laughs> Well, I think it's it's very interesting. I mean, looking at how uh, the apocalypse story sort of played out in different countries and in different times as well. I mean, you know, um, a, a story like uh, the War of the Worlds is very different from the Day of the Triffids, which is nineteen fifties British um, yep. British apocalypse story. Um, but that's very different from oh god, I mean, you know, a, a computer game like Fallout, which mm-hmm. is very you know traveling across a blasted wasteland, which almost seems to have become the archetypal uh, apocalypse story. So there's lots of different stories you can tell. Yeah, 
Yeah. Of course, Mad Max is in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I should have said Mad Max. <laughs> Yeah, no, that sounds uh, that sounds fantastic. Um, what are you working on currently? Is there anything new that you can tell us about? Um, at the moment, I'm at, so I always go through phases, right? So I, I do kind of big things, and then I kind of go, okay, now I've done enough big things. Now I'm doing lots of small things. So um, so now I'm actually taking a break from sort of big publishing things at the moment. So a few years ago, I did, or like two or three years ago, I published Cthulhu Dark. And, um, and that was a lot of work. And then a year after that, I, I did a, a large scale LARP um, with a designer here called Joanna Pincastelli. So we did this uh, superhero school LARP in this big country house. And that was a huge project as well. So I, I'm sort of steering away from huge projects at the moment. Uh, right at the moment, I have Oh, I have so many little drafts of things. I have um, I, I have a LARP about um, e- an East European state in the uh, in the 1980s, and I have um, a more light-hearted game, which is called the Crime Bunnies Role Playing Game, which is literally about rabbits who commit crime doing a heist. I'll tell you whether I don't know whether it's going to work yet, but if it does, we're playing it next weekend. But that's what I'm doing. I'm writing lots of silly little drafts and I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> no, it sounds like a lot of fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, where can people uh, learn more about your work? Uh, so the best place is probably uh, you can find a lot of my stuff on Drive Through RPG and Cthulhu Dark um, and, and a few others is from Indie Press Revolution. So I think those are the places to start. All right, great. I will make sure that I include links to all of those and to some of uh, your books and that that we have talked about in the podcast in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com so everybody uh, can check those out and uh, learn more about those. Um, So Graham, thank you so much for uh, taking time today uh, out of your schedule to talk with me and uh, talk about games and that. Uh, Thank you so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, there you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Graham today. It was an absolute pleasure to speak with him. As I mentioned, I have provided links in the show notes for this episode so you can check out Graham's work. Please head over there and check those out. I have a link to his book, Play Unsafe, which you should definitely check out. Now, if you want some free stuff, head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You will get 10 free dungeon maps. Plus, you'll never miss an episode of this show, and you will get updates on what I am working on every Friday. Now, if you would like to support the show in some way, I would greatly appreciate it. You can tell your friends, you can leave a review, you can subscribe. You can also support the show on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash dicegeeks. Any bit of support that I receive there just lets me know that I should continue making this show. I thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep gaming.